relatively speaking, it is very safe. So uh, then, and as I know that some of you are also involved with, uh, uh, you can combine some of this type of uh, uh, technologies, combining, for example, vibration with uh, electromagnetic uh, type of uh, uh, interactions. And so as to optimize the, the, the way we transfer one form of energy into another form of energy. So there's definitely a lot of potential when we look at uh, actually uh, putting together different technologies the thing that, uh, for example, we also studied the ability um, to create uh, uh, magnetic uh, uh, di uh, sorry, yeah, we can call it magnetic dipoles arrays that we're actually free to mechanically move and actually create uh, uh, a very high Q resonance because of the array that automatically tend to actually align themselves and therefore obtain, uh, having extremely small masses, uh, obtain a very high uh, Q. So again, there's many ways that we can put together different technologies. And, um, you know, hey, if you want to go quantum, um, think about uh, quantum entanglement. Maybe you can transfer energy that way too. Who knows? So anyway, going to, um, oh, yeah, uh, one of the issues with the, uh, mechanical, I mean, ultrasound type of technology that makes it a little bit challenging in some of the application is the fact that the energy that you can receive, that you can extract, is really very much dependent from the volume of the receiver. So that's one of the reasons why it has been difficult to use this inside the body, because if you want to create a very tiny sensor and, uh, and, and basically power it up at the distance through ultrasound. Now, the problem is that, uh, you know, the size size matters uh, when you talk about uh, mechanical energy. So that's one of the challenges with that technology. So the advantage of the EM field, electromagnetic fields, is that you can scale down the receiver, uh, the size of the receiver, by increasing the frequency. So fundamentally, there's, uh, there's an interplay there between uh, uh, size and frequency. So you can scale things pretty well with electromagnetic fields. The challenge with scaling down the size and scaling up the frequency is that uh, the safety limit for, uh, you know, SAR, um, which we'll talk about later, but fundamentally the absorption of a body, um, the, the, the rate of absorption of energy by a body, and therefore its safety uh, for human beings and, and animals, Unfortunately, that limit goes down with frequency. So you're like, okay, I like to go higher frequency. I can uh, make the receiver smaller. Uh, but then the problem is that I can actually send less energy because our bodies are more sensitive to the higher frequencies. So that's, that's a challenge there, but, but again, has been solved in many areas. So just something to be aware. Um, the other thing is that uh, when we talk about uh, You can transfer energy both from the electric field and the magnetic field. So both of them are capable of transferring energy. Uh, most of the applications we see are basically uh, through the magnetic field because they can be done at fairly uh, low voltage. Um, if you try to transfer energy with the electric field, as soon as the distance starts being significant, because fundamentally is a capacitive type of transfer, uh, as soon as the distance starts growing, uh, you need a very high voltage. And if you want an example of, uh, of that, you go into the uh, emergency room and you think about uh, you know, the, the, the principle being used for the cardiac stimulators, bang, that's a high voltage and that's an energy transfer of power. Uh, at high voltage. And that's because it's uh, an electric field uh, uh, transfer, not a magnetic field. So anyway, we'll, we'll see more of this later. Um, and uh, especially we'll talk about frequency selection. As I show here, again, we can operate uh, at low frequency. We can operate uh, RF, millimeter wave, but also with light. So you can use lasers, for example, or even LEDs to transfer power. So we can transfer power at any frequency in the elect with the electromagnetic field. We can also transfer power thermally. Uh, there are thermoelectric generators. One of the reasons why they're not so popular, except for some energy harvesting type of uh, solution, is that they typically work all between, uh, because of the difference in temperature 
between two, the two sides of the thermoelectric generator, and they don't work on the absolute temperature. So that's, that limits a little bit that activity. And then finally, also chemically, uh, a battery is a simple example of basically transferring power from a chemical uh, solution to an electrical form of energy. And that can be done also uh, in a way uh, wirelessly, although certainly there needs to be some form of contact between the parts. Um, but, uh, you know, as an example, uh, there was a company that uh, developed uh, a pill which could uh, um, inform the doctor that the pill was ingested. Uh, the pill basically had uh, particular electrodes and the chemical uh, type of uh, uh, solution so that as the pill entered the stomach, and uh, uh, was in the presence of the acids inside the stomach would actually create a battery and therefore generate enough energy to allow the transmission of the signal out of the pill to say, hey, I reached the stomach, I've been ingested. So, yep, uh, that guarantees that uh, that pill had been actually used. So, again, there's many ways that we can uh, create and transfer energy. So, uh, let's see... Um, Going back to the wireless power transfer through electromagnetic field, as I mentioned, there are different types of technologies and techniques that can be used. Uh, so we go from the short range. And, and again, uh, people tend to see that as a, an issue of convenience. I mean, how far can you go um, with, with the range, basically? So you have a short range, which is the inductive coupling. Uh, the most uh, typical examples are the typical Qi chargers for phones. Uh, then you have the short to mid range, which uses mag magnetic resonance. And, uh, and both of those are really in the near field. And then you have the, the far field approach, which is allows basically to have the long range uh, type of uh, uh, power transfer. And that really, uh, as I mentioned, is, is a development that's, that, that was already there in the 60s when they uh, actually transfer power via microwaves. So those technologies uh, are now refined in many applications. So let's look at, um, at some of this and understand the differences. So in the near field, um, there's nearly a linear fall off of the energy with distance. And as you are close to the uh, transmitter, basically, there's, there's a very mild drop in the ability to actually transfer power, which is an advantage. On the opposite, if you're in the far field regime, and by the way, far field, near field, uh, near field is um, usually considered like less than one tenth of the uh, wavelength. Far field is typically, you know, a, a multiple of the wavelength. And of course, uh, the wavelength, uh, you know, uh, as the relationship of one over frequency, and therefore, uh, fundamentally, we immediately understand that uh, if you want to operate in the near field, you typically you operate at lower frequencies, so that uh, uh, the uh, um, the distance is short relative to the wavelength. And if you want to operate in the far field, obviously, you're going to be operating with frequencies that are much higher. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so. The, in the near field, basically, the, the, the ability to transfer energy remains fairly strong even as we move away from the transmitter. And to give you an idea, pretty much the range that you care about is a range that is a distance that is less than the dimension, call it diameter, if you wish, of, uh, of the transmit antenna. So to give you kind of a very, very quick uh, sense about where can you transfer power? Well, fundamentally, in the near field, uh, the, <clears throat> the ability to transfer power is at a distance which is less than the diameter of the transmit antenna. Now, you can extend that with techniques like, uh, uh, like um, multiple antennas, uh, antennas or antenna arrays and focus in the field and all those kind of things. But the point is that in the near field, uh, the, the type of uh, physics that regulate that are quite different than in the far field, uh, which means that, uh, you know, there's a lot of limitations to trying to focus in the field, in the near field. Um, in the far field, on the opposite, uh, the energy drops with the square of the distance and the square of the frequency. And that really uh, uh, poses a significant challenge in basically how far you can go unless you utilize very strong gains in the antenna, which are basically obtained by antenna rays and field focusing, as we will 
uh, mention later. So another thing that uh, sometimes is uh, misunderstood is the difference between, uh, um, let's say, inductive coupling and magnetic resonance. So first of all, the two principles are very similar. The difference is simply in, in how high the Q of the transmitter and receiver antennas are. But there's always uh, in the public domain this concept, this idea that magnetic resonance is less efficient than than inductive coupling. And that is completely wrong. The difference is minimal uh, in terms of the, uh, at, at let's say zero distance. The difference is that uh, basically when you <clears throat> use magnetic resonance, uh, let's see if I can point to that, the efficiency of the coupling uh, drops very slowly as the distance increases. And that's why with magnetic resonance, you can actually uh, obtain um, power transfer at a distance. Well, if you do inductive coupling, the efficiency of the power transfer drops very quickly as soon as the distance, um, you know, increases. And by distance, you know, sometimes we talk millimeters. That's why uh, fundamentally, if you take a, a, a typical application of a phone chargers, um, you know, uh, you get a, a pretty good efficiency if you're perfectly aligned. But as soon as you move it a few millimeter of misalignment, your efficiency drops very, very quickly. And that's why, uh, you know, to overcome that, Apple has now utilized magnetic uh, um, uh, magnets, basically, to kind of force the alignment. So fundamentally, now it looks like a transformer. Uh, but that's hardly, you know... Uh, as X, Y, Z freedom. Basically, you have to be locked up mechanically to get the power transfer. So that's that's the difference between the two. But, you know, in the best case scenario, when you have uh, very little separation between transmitter and receiver, the difference in efficiency is only a few percent. So people say, so why do we typically see efficiency down in the 60% or something like that? Well, that has nothing to do with the antenna coupling. That has to do with all the rest of the circuits inside that actually dissipate uh, energy. And of course, you can make them much better, but they're more expensive. So fundamentally, uh, there's a correlation between how much you pay for things and how efficient they are. And so obviously, the commercial companies will try to get away with the lowest cost to an efficiency that basically uh, is acceptable. So why uh, inductive coupling has been much more uh, successful than magnetic resonance in the market is simply the complexity of developing magnetic resonance type of solution. The complexity is, is incredible in the sense of all the variables you have to take into consideration as you charge multiple devices at multiple distance with different coupling factors. Um, you know, fundamentally, uh, we calculated, okay, if we really needed to uh, simulate all the possible corners for uh, what was, you know, developed actually um, and commercialized uh, by, by uh, wireless charging, uh, you know, you would end up with something like 10 to the 75 simulations. <laughs> so you got to do things a little bit smarter than just trying to simulate all the corners of all the possible uh, things. And so actually we're lucky to work with one of the creators of the CDMA, uh, one of the scientists that invented C CDMA. And uh, he was, uh, you know, one of those scientists that enjoys everything that is complicated and, and helped uh, a lot into creating this technology. And one of his comments was actually that uh, the wireless power transfer is much more complicated than CDMA. Uh, and so again, you know, we need to make sure that once you embark in something, you know that is going to take a lot of effort, but, but the results pay uh, if you stick to it. And that's uh, what happened uh, with the, the white power group. And they were able to actually get all the way to commercialization. So going back to the basics, you know, what is the uh, concept of uh, inductive power transfer? It's basically the application of two physical laws, Ampere's law. So fundamentally, when you have a current in a conductor, you create a magnetic field around it. And Faraday's law that says that if you couple a magnetic field uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a conductor, you will generate a voltage uh, at the extreme of that conductor. So that's the basic. <clears throat> And then, obviously, uh, we can go and uh, apply all the real, you know, laws of, uh, of magnetism and uh, go through all these kind of formulas. But, you know, um, those only works if you have a very simply, simple solution to look for. And realistically, uh, as I said, uh, good luck if you want to try to implement those formula on a, on a real solution. 
So that's why we look uh, more often to the circuit perspective, which is a simplification of the whole thing. And you can extract <clears throat> basically the, the, the fundamental formulas uh, for that. But again, pay attention to the fact that these are simplification of reality, uh, which look good uh, and simple, but the load is not the resistor. The load is a complex uh, uh, type of uh, um, impedance. Uh, same is true for the transmitter. So basically, again, this formula looks good on a paper, but don't help you completely to solve the solution. Uh, but I'll give you something much simpler than that, which is, you know, what is really important to remember if you operate between inductive and magnetic resonance, and the two are fundamentally utilizing the same principle. The key formula, if you look at uh, this type of coupling where you have basically a, a, a coupling between two circuits which are typically resonant or you may not make them resonant if you want and that's inductive coupling but even with inductive coupling there's always a little bit of resonance utilized to improve the, Q, the the power transfer so the maximum efficiency that you can get into the power transfer is basically uh, given by this formula okay and uh, this is not exact it's uh, it's a simplification of a formula when it, uh, when the efficiency is close to one. So otherwise you'll see that this formula falls apart. But assuming that you want to do an efficient power transfer so that you have uh, an efficiency that is better than, than 50%, basically, then this formula is, is pretty close to reality. Uh, what does this formula tell you? That really your efficiency is dictated by how big the product of the coupling coefficient and the square root of the product of the quality factors of the two uh, resonant tanks is. So how do you achieve uh, power transfer uh, you know, in the two cases? You have the case of the inductive power transfer where the, the, the two uh, sides of the transformer are very close to each other, and therefore the K factor is very high. I mean, the coupling factor is close to one. Therefore, you can afford a fairly low, um, let's say, quality factor uh, to achieve a, a reasonably high efficiency. But as you move farther away from uh, between the two sides, as your coupling factor drops significantly from one, then you need to make up with basically high quality factor in the two uh, tanks. And those are the resonant tanks. And so therefore, Fundamentally, that's how you end up with magnetic resonant type of coupling. Fundamentally, you need to make relatively highly resonant uh, type of uh, uh, circuits. Now, what is the limit to your quality factor that you can achieve? The limit is that on one side, you have a transmitter and the quality factor, I mean, and that transmitter, that amplifier will have some intrinsic resistance. So that degrades the quality factor of, let's say, Q1. And on the other side, you have a load, and the load is typically resistive if you want to extract the real uh, energy. And therefore, that will limit the Q you can achieve on the receive side. So fundamentally, that's why, as I mentioned before, realistically, when you, when you do a magnetic resonant type of power transfer, um, you end up that uh, the, the, the maximum distance is about the same as the diameter of the, of the uh, transmit antenna, because as you go farther away, the coupling factor K drops so much that you cannot make it up with just increasing Q. You just can't get a Q that is that high, okay? So that is something to keep in mind. The other important consideration is the frequency at which you're operating. And the frequency of, uh, of operation is important because typically you are in the presence of metal uh, type of structures because of the type of things you are actually powering up. And therefore, the point is that uh, the, the, the metals actually absorb the electromagnetic uh, energy of the field, and typically they dissipate it into, um, into heat. And of course, each metal has a different characteristics. The worst ones are the ones that are resistive. Therefore, if you have, for example, um, steel or things like that, uh, but fundamentally, because of the depth of the penetration of the field in the metal, that is related to uh, the, the skin effect, basically, that the two uh, are very much related to each other, you'll see that as you go to low frequency, you're going, the metals are going to absorb a lot of energy. And that's what made it difficult for uh, the inductive charging to actually obtain a freedom of position. Because as soon as the field basically is large enough to escape the receiver and basically illuminate um, 
the, the object you're trying to power up, you're going to transfer more power to the metals of the object and heat up the object rather than transferring power to the receiver. So <clears throat> what can we do with a resonance that is also interesting? Um, one thing was, how do you power things through a metal structure? Uh, because typically, as you know, metal absorbs energy and will absorb energy at any frequency. Um, the interesting thing, actually, is that if you go to very low frequency, um, your skin depth is much larger potentially than the, um, than the metal thickness. And therefore, you can transfer energy across a metal, even at very low frequency, but remembering that a lot of energy will be also dissipated into the metal. As you go to higher frequency, you have the advantage that if the metal is, say, very conductive, like aluminum, which is typically used for cases, that the metal will not dissipate uh, uh, much energy, not at all. Um, but uh, how you go across the metal um, is interesting. You can basically use slots and holes to actually focus the field um, around certain uh, features of the device and then capture that current that you generate into the metal body, like use the metal body itself as a resonant uh, uh, structure. And so basically, if I uh, look at what happens if I put a slot there, what happens is that the field generates a current into the metal body that can be focused around the hole. And therefore, I can capture that current if I put internally another coil that couples to the flow of current into the body. And actually, this has been very successfully uh, implemented. Uh, we were able to actually transfer uh, higher power than normally transferred uh, through a regular plastic body by just doing that. Um, another interesting thing is to pay attention to small devices. And this is very important as you go to, let's say, wearables or even implants in the body. Uh, what is the key thing? If you try to use, let's say, low frequencies, then you need to remember uh, one of the formulas we saw earlier, that the voltage you get on the receiver is proportional to the frequency because it's proportional to the D phi over DT, the variation of the field. So, and of course, you know, if you look at the old transformer structure is basically uh, proportional to the number of turns that you have because fundamentally each turn in the receiving coil captures the energy uh, it captures the variation of the flux. So you, uh, you put more turns, you multiply uh, the voltage across. So the problem is that if you work at low frequencies and you have a small object, uh, the area of the receiving coil is very small. So you capture a very small amount of field. And so you have to make up by putting a lot of turns into that coil so that to basically get enough voltage at the output. And that is a limitation at operating at low frequencies. So in principle, what you want to do is really to operate at much higher frequency uh, compatibly with uh, you know, uh, field uh, constraints due to safety and so on. And so again, you, know, you can actually operate, uh, do some interesting things with, uh, with higher frequencies. And if you want to go down, you not only go to the low megahertz, but you can go to the higher megahertz range and obtain actually very, very interesting results that. Now let's go to the far field. The far field regime is what uh, you see often uh, touted, uh, uh, you know, I can power up your phone at uh, meters of distance and all that kind of stuff. Well, not really in the sense that uh, uh, far field, as I mentioned, has the problem that the um, attenuation is really um, significant over distance and grows significantly with frequency. So uh, fundamentally, let's look at uh, how the far field works. Um, you have a transmitter, you have uh, basically an antenna, you have a certain distance, and you have basically a receive antenna and the receiver. So how much power goes between the transmitter and the receiver is the product of all of these pieces. So the free space loss is really the one that basically um, uh, is, is significant and, and grows with frequency. So this goes with the square of the distance and loss, uh, the reduction in power goes with the square of the distance and the square of the frequency. So you can imagine when you operate at megahertz uh, uh, or, uh, or, or gigahertz range that fundamentally the attenuation is huge. You make up for that by utilizing a gain in the antenna. Uh, what does that mean again in the antenna? Okay, so let's go to um, 
the fundamental frequency, as I mentioned, uh, the, the attenuation over the air is distance times frequency squared. Okay. So the way you actually increase the power of the receiver is by compensating by increasing the antenna gain. And the antenna gain can be increased by having many, many uh, elements in the antenna and therefore uh, creating a specific uh, phased array that actually generates a beam forming or fundamentally focuses the field, not 360 degrees around the antenna, but basically focuses in the direction of the receiver. So that is the way to do that, but we need to pay attention to the fact that, uh, um, that, uh, that um, the antenna array has some fundamental constraints. Uh, so let me just go back to this. The antenna array is built by actually creating a, an array of elements. And to make that work, you need to place them at lambda over two distance from each other, half the wavelength. So as you go to lower frequencies, uh, the wavelength increases. Therefore, the array needs to be much bigger to have the same number of elements. As you go to higher frequencies, you can shrink the array and make it relative, uh, have a lot of elements in a small areas, but you are losing in the, dist in, in the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the attenuation over the air goes down with the square of the distance. So again, you need to trade off these two capabilities. So if you can make the transmit antenna as large as you want, then you're better off going at low frequencies. But if you're constrained by the antenna size and you want to get significant gain, then you need to go to higher frequencies so that you can implement a lot of elements within that area. And so that's where the trade-off is. And there's formulas that are very well known where you can calculate that. And that's why basically when you see uh, this kind of applications, uh, people tell you, yes, I can transfer that power, uh, but you know, you look at the details and say, mm, that's okay for low power. But if you're trying to actually transfer a lot of power, either you need to, to have a huge antenna or, and the cost goes up uh, and it's uh, unlikely you're going to be able to do it, or uh, fundamentally you have to accept the lower frequency. Also, you can do beam steering, but as uh, you know, you will find out, beam steering reduces the efficiency. So again, uh, we can go into a lot of details, but, you know, overall, we need to keep this uh, kind of set of uh, uh, elements in mind. Lower frequency, have longer range, you have less attenuation, but you need uh, the antenna gain. And antenna gain is achieved by using an array to focus the beam. And so to have a large gain, you need a large number of elements that must be spaced at lambda over two. Therefore, you get a large antenna. No free lunch. Unfortunately, physics always tests our ability to find better solutions. And by the way, um, as I was probably mentioning when I talked to Dr. Raj, you know, there's interesting solution that can be done by utilizing um, metamaterials. So, you know, something to think about. Very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, uh, something about regulatory, you can find information. There's two kinds of regulatory considerations. There's emission, and there's part 15 and part 18 of the FCC rules and safety. And basically safety uh, is involves both current density, specific absorption rate, uh, which is the SAR, and induced electric field. And, um, you know, fundamentally, SAR gets worse at high frequency, and induced uh, current density uh, basically gets worse at low frequency. That's why, uh, you know, if you look at uh, realistically uh, all the cases about physical problems, you'll see that uh, the most uh, famous ones are the 50 hertz of the main uh, things. People working in the high power environment uh, uh, that are just 50 hertz have the ones that have had the biggest physical problems and they're very well documented because uh, you know uh, again people talk about the SAR but you know you need to be careful about both so you know please stop the nonsense that I hear very often about safety um, you cannot commercialize a product unless it passes safety compliance certification no matter what the competition says so please stop this nonsense such comments are really typically done by marketing people. So the regulations that, that oversee this kind of safety are made by hundreds of scientists all over the world that create the standards in the US, in Europe, and other countries. That is their job. I'm not going to listen to the opinions of someone that has read two articles from questionable sources and pretend to be an expert. 
that said, if you believe that uh, electromagnetic fields are bad for you in general, well, I cannot contradict you. But I can guarantee you get a lot more electromagnetic field uh, radiation from your Wi-Fi and your cellular phones than you get from a wireless charger. So just study the physics. So these subjects are for the next time we meet. Uh, there's a lot more to dig in, so I'm not going to try to do it in a short period. Um, wireless charging is for everything. I was asked to basically consider what about uh, powering up a, a radar transmitter? Uh, because, you know, these things moves and nobody likes wires across uh, devices that move 360 degrees. <clears throat> I was asked by NASA to actually help uh, uh, develop wireless charging in the space station because wires are a hazard. Uh, I was asked uh, to consider how do you power up shells in a refrigerator? Um, obviously, a hospital is, is a great place for wireless charging because you need to wash all these devices, all the electrical devices need to be washed in autoclave. They need to be completely sealed. You don't want, you know, plugs in them. Um, obviously, you know, the desktop, all of those things need to be wirelessly charged. I was asked to actually, uh, can we develop some wireless charging to be used in the shower? Because again, you, are, you don't wanna have electrical contacts. Uh, wireless charging for, you know, uh, smart tags, in, in, the, in the stores, wireless charging to power up robotics uh, in, for industrial application and others, wireless charging for actually powering um, devices, uh, you know, implants, um, these are becoming very important. So again, your imagination is all you need to figure out how many places you can use wireless charging. So don't focus on just the smartphones, that's, uh, that's all news. Uh, there's so many areas where we can actually use this. And <laughs> now, uh, some, uh, let's say, suggestions. Engineering and wireless charging is a really tough job. I mean, you need to really dedicate yourself. So uh, these are some of my favorite uh, authors, let's say, and, and quotes. Only the paranoid survives. You need to really dig in. Uh, Pareto, that's important for life. I mean, everything you do, you need to always focus on the most important things. Um, always remember that uh, the best way to innovate is to know already what everything, what has been already developed by everybody else, because don't, don't try to reinvent uh, what has been already found. So read everything first before you try to innovate. Uh, managing engineering jobs is even tougher. Uh, Murphy's law always, always bites you in the back. Uh, entropy uh, is the other important uh, laws of physics that you need to be aware of. Um, again, it takes a lot of energy to keep things aligned. Ohm's law for electrical engineer is very important. Typically, all the mistakes you do is because you forgot to apply Ohm's law to all the details, including parasitics and so on. And the rest uh, of the blow ups are caused by the fact you forgot that things blow up when you exceed the voltage. Other lessons to know about is the short blanket problem. Don't try to fit something that doesn't fit in an implementation you're trying to do. When you try to stretch things past what they're capable of doing, better start from scratch. And uh, the lion, the gazelle, you know, no matter how smart you are, you need to start early and run fast. And that's all, including the most important thing, enjoy what you do. It's a tough job. And only if you enjoy it, that you will be able to really dedicate the energy to be the next successful uh, developer of a new technology. So thank you again. And please uh, feel free to ask any questions. I didn't see anything while I was talking, but uh, if you want more details also, feel free to contact me at any time. And uh, uh, I may as well also uh, write down a uh, contact information, but uh, you can ask Dr. Raj, and he will be able to provide it to you. Thank you, I think it's excellent. A very broad and nice overview. And that's exactly what we want in this industry seminar series. We want to provide a broad perspective to mostly undergrads and dads on the breadth of the technology, the market impact, product impact, intellectual property generation, and some of these uh, business constraints and safety constraints. So very useful. If anyone has any questions, you can always unmute yourself and ask. And uh, or you can put in the chat and I can read it for you. So any questions from anyone? Uh, actually, I have a question. So yes, it's typing. Uh, actually, uh, in the beginning, you chose uh, like a, a charger, like uh, it can be charged for both sides, you say symmetrically, and uh, 
I, I just thinking if we block off one side of the signal, will that like uh, make it more efficient to charge in the other side? <laughs> so <clears throat> fundamentally, uh, yeah, the field comes out on both sides when you have an antenna. Uh, let's see, somewhere here I had uh, a picture probably of an antenna here. This is uh, a, a popular antenna for 6.78 megahertz. It just sees a few turns of wires in air. There's no magnetic material. So the field expands on both directions. Uh, you can make the field go into only one direction, of course, by putting a shield, by putting magnetic material. But the objective here was to really make it cheap uh, so that fundamentally, you know, if you don't need to focus the field in only one direction, then, you know, there's no point uh, adding material. Okay, but certainly you can. Uh, there's some interesting things here that you actually can spot uh, in, in the receiver side. And I invite you to uh, look at that and study what was done uh, in this article because uh, there's stuff that is not published. <laughs> so there's many ways you can use different uh, materials and things to actually create interesting focusing of the field or interesting other uh, type of uh, so you, you wonder why, for example, there's a coil here and there's a, a piece of, uh, of uh, metal actually with a, with a slot on top of it. Uh, again, mysteries of, uh, of physics. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Know that these things transmit information at a distance, right? You know, yeah. so information is a form of energy, so I don't know if something like that can be done. Of course, you would have to use not just two atoms, but the whole number of atoms to achieve any substantial energy transfer. But you know, the sky's the limit. You know, I only can say one thing that um, everything is possible, uh, nothing uh, unless you break the fundamental. Uh, constraint of space-time continuum, you can achieve anything. It's just a matter of time and money, okay? So, uh, and maybe in the future we'll find some other physics for which you can break even the space-time continuum. But, you know, at present, with the physics that we know, uh, that's the difficult part. But everything else is just a matter of time and money. So, you know, uh, I invite you to think about the craziest idea. Uh, what you learn during brainstorming is that there is no stupid idea. You know, the important thing is to actually allow that's how everything has been invented, is because somebody broke some fundamental rules. Uh, sometimes they ended up in jail for that. So think about, uh, uh, you know, Galileo Galilei, you know, he, just by saying that the sun was at the center and not the earth at the center of the universe. You know, so sometimes you can get in trouble for, for you know, <laughs> for these things, but never stop yourself from thinking <laughs> and going outside the box. Thank you. But I don't have a solution for quantum entanglement yet. I, 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 I try to stay away from quantum uh, physics uh, because it's not my field. <laughs> I happen to study a little bit about it in which it said that uh, the human teleporting will be one day possible. It utilizes a quickly acted at a distance of uh, two atoms, basically. Yeah, and, and so I'll tell you one thing. I'm sure we can teleport anything. The problem is to reconstruct it exactly at the other end. So yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> I see also a question online, actually. Uh, I believe you mentioned earlier of metals absorbing energy from high frequency waves with some EMD electricity. Is it possible a wireless power transfer can cause issue to people with metal implants? Yeah. Um, so, actually, more than metals, uh, magnetic material is a challenge. So, uh, it's not, I didn't show it in here, uh, but we developed. Uh, so let, let me put it this way. Where do we get uh, a lot of uh, magnetic field in the body? When you take an MRI, okay? You take an MRI and you're exposed to a magnetic field of high intensity <clears throat> between the frequency of say 20 megahertz and 300 megahertz or something. Now even higher they're going. So that's a really pro big problem, especially if you have a piece of magnetic material. So one of the challenges that we have there when we try to power up a, uh, a, 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 a sensor in the body was that typically you receive this energy through an antenna and the voltage varies quite a bit. And so you will see that uh, you need typically a DC-DC converter, a voltage converter to basically power up the battery. And the typical 
DC DC converter is a buck converter or whatever you want to you know use use typically an inductor an inductor to be small enough you use magnetic material uh, as a core for the inductor that is a problem because if you put it under an MRI that's going to blow up in your body <laughs> so if you read the, this article here you will actually see that we made a receiver uh, with the magnetic resonance that has no inductors uh, no magnetic material um, actually, it has inductance, but no magnetic material because we were able to actually utilize, well, I spoke with uh, Dr. Raj at the beginning, tunable capacitors to actually um, use the resonance itself to do the, the, the voltage translation. So there's no DC-DC converter. <laughs> so you can read it all in this, in this paper. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting way of doing power conversion without DC-DC converters by using resonance. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, I was the one who asked the question, and I it just came to my mind about potential like medical issues because yes. um, I was thinking about what you were talking about the far field about powering things in such a far distance, and somebody who might have a metal implant like are they yes. affected by that? Uh, it just came to my mind. So, so as I said, the advantage of using higher frequencies is that the skin depth is very sh small, so they dissipate very little power in the metal. You have to be careful about paramag paramagnetic materials and diamagnetic materials because they tend to absorb more energy from the electromagnetic field. Um, and, 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 and in general, metals that have high resistivity, like say stainless steel, for example, those tend to absorb more energy. But as I mentioned, the higher the frequency, the lower the problem. That's why you don't want to use low frequencies uh, for this. Uh, as you are, let's say above one megahertz, um, you're much better off. And then, you know, at higher frequency, you need to look more at other effects. Like, for example, you know that uh, that uh, water absorbs uh, uh, energy at uh, in the two gigahertz range, right? So obviously, heating the you know you need yeah. to study all the pieces of the of puzzle. <laughs> it's a lot of details. Uh, oh, I found out another funny stuff. I mean, you can transfer energy at fifty kilohertz across your body, on your surface of your skin. Yes. <laughs> right that's mm -hmm. a weird phenomena too mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you go down to 50 kilo it's a little bit above uh, ultrasound uh the waves travel on the skin of your body <laughs> yeah without penetrating i think so it that's why i say never, never think that something is crazy <laughs> yeah i think it, i guess it all comes down to application yes and and so in some cases, it might be worthwhile going high frequency, but in others, you have to consider. Yeah. So another, another uh, work that was interesting was from that professor uh, at Stanford that tried to focus uh, um, microwave, uh, microwaves uh, in the body for powering up devices and using fundamentally an antenna array approach to focus the field. The problem with those approaches, I mean, everything can be done in a lab experiment. The problem is always think, what are the variables in the real world that you're going to have to overcome? And so, you know, in the real world, you can focus the beam at those frequency and, and obtain, uh, you know, a concentrated beam in the specific spot and you can transfer the power. But the problem is that that is highly dependent on the uh, um, tissues, which means that if the tissue changes, now all of a sudden your focusing is off. And, and, you know, how do you overcome that? I mean, you know, uh, as I said, the great idea, you know, for a paper, but, but it's never going to work in reality. So again, always think about where does this idea falls off the cliff, right? And if that cliff is realistic in real world life, I mean, you know, stay away from it. <laughs> Any other questions? But as I said, you know, this is just scratching the surface. I mean, there's so much detail, as, as, as that scientist said, wireless power transfer is very complicated, you know, and, and we always joke, what about it? It's just a couple of uh, coils, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's incredibly complicated, but that's what makes it so interesting. And what, that's what makes it uh, worthwhile studies, because if you, if you break those, uh, those limitations, if you find solutions, you can really solve real life problems. And there's so many, as I said, you know, uh, my point is, uh, these are just some examples of things. Oh, yeah, let me tell you another funny one. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's so many more like electric vehicle charging, sensor for agriculture, wearables, subcutaneous implants and stimulator. But another funny thing that, uh, that we actually developed, uh, we were asked by a Formula One team to actually develop a wireless charging approach to actually power up all the sensors in the chassis of a Formula One test car. 
because they put all these sensors in all places of the of the chassis and you cannot put wires in there they're sometimes molded inside the chassis or think about the other applications like sensors inside buildings or things like that you cannot wire this stuff and so basically we created a, a blanket approach to charge all the recharge after a test run you know recharge all of these devices inside the we're talking about hundreds <laughs> of sensors inside a Formula One car. <laughs> I have one quick question. You said the uh, odd number of coils can also work. So is there any uh, oh, strong that... tendency for three coils over four coils? No, okay. So let me let me tell you where that came from. Um, I, I didn't talk about the fact that uh, typically, um, and, and we need to go really into the concepts of the power transfer. And so fundamentally, if you have a series uh, resonant transmitter and a series resonant receiver, you can actually decouple uh, the loads so that you can have multiple loads that they don't see each other. So that's one fundamental thing. And the reason comes from here, the inversion of the impedance seen by the transmitter so that fundamentally the load of a receiver ends up being in series with the transmitter loop, ser series resonant loop, if you look at this formula. So fundamentally, they all end up in series. So if you force a constant current into the transmitter, then fundamentally you have completely uh, eliminated the coupling of the loads. And so it's, you can put as many as you want, change the, 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 the loads, do whatever you want. They, they just all take the energy independently of each other. And that you can do by the inversion. So if you put, for example, some applications that are four coil type of applications, so a dual coil at the input and a dual coil at the output. And so even in that case, you have basically three inversions. So you still end up with the right uh, behavior of, of the transmitter and the receiver. But if you do only two inversions, now what happens is that the, <laughs> the receivers interact with each other, okay? And that is a problem. And so basically the, the, the question was, how come this works? Uh, let's see, uh, how come this approach works? Because there's three uh, resonant tank, you know, with each other. The reason why it works is because the coupling of the inner coil with the metal is a very tight coupling, is not a magnetic resonant coupling, is like a true transformer. So fundamentally, this piece of, of the system uh, let's see, this piece of the system acts as a single resonant element, not as two. These two are like a transformer coupling, okay? High, high K. So, so there's really two inversions, not, sorry, there's only one inversion, not two, because the inversion occurs if you have a low K and you make up with, uh, with, uh, with resonance, because fundamentally you create a shift between the voltages and the current, which don't exist in a transformer. In a transformer with high coupling, uh, they are, they are, they are, the, 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 the phase is the same. But as you move them apart uh, and you increase the coupling, I mean, you, you have a decreased coupling, but you make up with resonance. Now you have a shift between the phases of the input and the output. So that's, that's the trick, <laughs> okay? But, but you don't have it in the last two coils because they're tightly coupled. Okay, so it's like a two coil type of system. Okay. So how does it, <laughs> question if you don't mind, one sure. short question. So how does this work with uh, compared to metamaterial lenses or focusing in the middle? Oh, the no, that's, that's uh, that the, 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 the metamaterial is really interesting. You know, um, we think we, we learn stuff in school and we don't realize that uh, during the physics classes we are fed uh, with basically uh, a, a, a much simplified version of reality. Um, metamaterials really explore the fact that, uh, you know, you take a material and you typically um, define it by the epsilon and the mu, right? The, the two uh, characteristics of the material that make it interact with an electric field or a magnetic field. And so you think that epsilon and mu are some constants of that material. That is totally not true. That's what you study in school, but it's not true. I mean, epsilon and mu are actually vectorial uh, quantities. <laughs> and so once you start actually uh, understanding that these things are much more complex than what you study in the first uh, physics course, you realize that you can actually utilize those properties to make the material look like something else. 
And, and specifically, of course, when you try to uh, create either, for example, extremely high epsilon um, in the thousands or negative mu's. And so fundamentally now the reflection and reflection of uh, classical optics um, still apply, but with, with the uh, equivalent mu or equivalent epsilon that are, uh, let's say, completely, um, uh, let's say, not part of the material, but generated by the structure. So as the wavelength is larger than the grid of these structures, then the wavelength doesn't, I mean, doesn't uh, interact with the structure, but, but it sees the material as having different properties. And so uh, some experiments, for example, that were really great to done at uh, <clears throat> Caltech, I believe, um, where, where fundamentally you, you change the equivalent uh, mu um, of, of the material in a circular way around it. So now all of a sudden that creates a focusing lens that doesn't need to be convex, it can be flat because it does the same thing. It bends the, the, the light in different angles depending on where you are. And so you can obtain the focusing without actually creating a convex structure. So again, you know, uh, that's the interaction of a metamaterial with the electromagnetic waves. It allows it to bend it in different ways. So that's why, uh, you know, there's interesting studies I've seen. Also, uh, one at the University of Bologna, um, um, uh, they call them, Oh gosh, uh, I can't even remember the name, but fundamentally with metamaterial, you can create incredibly sharp uh, peaks of transmission, um, you know, in, in, in a specific direction, because you, you create, instead of creating an array of antennas that, that, that basically focus the field in a certain direction, you create a lens, basically an electromagnetic lens. And, uh, and so there's really interesting possibilities there. All right, the questions I have are two quick ones. Is basically is the metamaterial uh, give us giving us more degrees of freedom and getting high efficiency compared to this three coil system? Is the metamaterial better, flexible in design options and so on? And secondly, is it practically implemented in anywhere the metamaterial based uh, intermediate focusing system? Yes, yes. Okay, so there's a company. Uh, I don't want to make publicity here, but you know uh, you can look it up. It's uh, Metaboards in England that actually developed uh, a, a surface that basically can. Uh, um, power up devices in different places um, by focusing the field through a meta surface type of approach. Uh, the interesting thing about meta surfaces is that, um, and, and that's why, you know, as you remember, we were chatting before uh, the use of uh, uh, tunable capacitors. So at high frequency, um, in general, uh, a meta surface is obtained by creating very tiny resonant circuits that are resonant at the frequency of interest, but that fundamentally are much smaller than the wavelength of at that frequency. So that fundamentally they're, they're, they're made to resonate at that frequency by adding uh, capacitance uh, to the, uh, creating an LC circuit, if you wish. That can be made in many different ways depending on the frequency you're utilizing. So since it is a resonant circuit, miniaturized resonant circuit, and it is composed by an inductance and a capacitance, if you have a tunable capacitor or a tunable inductor for that matter, but tunable capacitors are easier, then you can modify the, um, the behavior of each individual cell in this metamaterial. So you can create behaviors in this metamaterial that actually are whatever you want. And so one of these behaviors is to actually su surf to use surface uh, um, wave uh, waves, electromagnetic waves. I think uh, there's a name for that. I, I keep forgetting these names, but anyway, uh, you know, the scientists have this uh, uh, funny ways of creating names for everything. And so there's this surface waves, electromagnetic waves that interact with the surface. And so if you modify the surface characteristics um, through this meta material concept, you can have an interaction of surface waves with the surface and fundamentally obtain distribution of the field that is different in different parts of the surface. And that is one of the interesting ways that you can resolve the SAR, the safety issue. If you basically focus the field only where you need it, where you have a device to charge and not everywhere, then you can reduce the issue of, uh, of having uh, basically, uh, you know, a, a field that goes everywhere and, 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 and goes into human tissue. 
Okay, so there's a lot of interesting application of, uh, of metamaterials that, that haven't really been explored that much. I started to study that, I bought a book on that and I'm like, I, I stopped at the second chapter because the formulas were getting so big that I was like, oh gosh. <laughs> but, you know, uh, when, you know, this is what happens after 30 years you're in the industry and, uh, you know, for young minds that still enjoy seeing big formulas, uh, then it's an excellent field to study. <laughs> uh, for people that uh, basically uh, have been in the industry for a long time and fundamentally figured out, yeah, forget the formulas. I, you know, I pretty much know where this is going to go. Uh, it's difficult to go back to, you know, looking at big formulas. 